The demand picture remains really strong off the back of a healthy underlying Chinese economy, but it's not just China. We get to make our decisions independent of, of, of political control, direct political control. There will not be more, any more mining. Um, Ethereum's uh, energy consumption will go down from by like a factor of more than 1,000. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Wednesday, 18th of August. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. The Taliban leadership in exile returns to Afghanistan. The White House says it's in contact with a militant group to allow safe passage through the airport. COVID-19 cases rise in lockdown Australia and New Zealand. The RBNZ holds steady on rates, worried about the impact of the outbreak. Attention turns to today's Fed minutes. Plus, wildfires rage through France and Spain. More than 10,000 people are evacuated from the Saint-Tropez region. What role can finance play in mitigating the climate crisis? So, U.S. stocks have posted their biggest decline in a month amid growth and virus concerns. After a positive session through much of Asia, European equities and U.S. futures are now searching for direction. Attention turning to Jackson Hole Symposium next week, which may, of course, offer clues on when and how the central bank will taper bond purchases. Now let's get straight to our market story with Danny Berger. Danny, great to have you back on, on the markets in this hour. I've missed you. When you look at investors, I mean, first of all, volumes were quite low. And yeah. it is true that markets are kind of looking for a direction. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Look, it's one of these weird summer months where maybe more people are off the desk. And then you combine that with the fact we get FOMC minutes later. You also have Jackson Hole on deck. So all of those means we're not going to get too much participation in this market. So markets really, really struggling to climb that wall of worry. We're continuing to see U.S. futures drop after the biggest drop in the cash equity market yesterday in about a month. And European stocks also falling just about five basis points, but still it's this directionless where the center of gravity is lower because of some of these growth concerns. You mentioned uh, the RBNZ uh, also putting rates on hold after just one case of COVID. It shows how the market story and the central bank story can really turn on a dime. So just continuing on from this kind of idea of the wall of worry and not being able to climb it today, we are seeing some of the havens perform better, gold being one of them. The VIX also hanging around 18%, pushing up to 19% yesterday, its highest in about two weeks, Francine. So, Danny, but what about VIX? Are investors prepared for higher volatility? Well, there has been a lot of option buying to prepare for some bearishness uh, for the past couple of weeks. And I think that kind of is normal when you have a market that is climbing. It's healthy to see people going and buying protection. So we see it in options. In the latest Bank of America survey, people were buying health care as their number one sector, something we haven't seen in over a year. But this really encapsulates what the volatility picture looked like heading in to yesterday's more uh, 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 slumping market. This is the volatility of volatility, the VIX, it tracks options around the VIX itself versus the VIX. So basically, the volatility of the VIX had been climbing higher, uh, heading up beyond a premium of seven percentage points heading into yesterday. And all of this just suggests, Francine, that people were hedging. So if the market fell yesterday, at least some smart money wasn't caught out wrong-footed. Danny, thank you so much. Our Danny Berger there with the very latest on the markets. Now, the Taliban leadership in exile returns to Afghanistan. The militant group has pledged not to target neighboring countries. At a press conference in Kabul, its spokesperson promised it would build an inclusive government and protect the rights of women. God willing, in accordance with Sharia law, we will allow women to work. Women are an important element of the society, and we will respect them. In all walks of life, where the society needs them, they will have an active presence. Meanwhile, the White House says it's in contact with the Taliban to allow safe passage through the Kabul airport. The U.S. is seeking to finish its evacuation by the end of August. We are engaging diplomatically at the same time with allies in regional countries and with the United Nations to address the situation in Afghanistan. We are in contact with the Taliban to ensure the safe passage of people to the airport. Well, joining us now for more is Bloomberg's Simone Foxman from Doha, where until recently the Afghan government and the Taliban were holding talks. So, Simone, good morning. How credible are the Taliban promises? 
Yeah, I mean, really, we'll have to see it to believe it. They're saying all the right things that the international community uh, wants to hear at this point. Um, uh, rights of women, uh, also amnesty for people who worked for the previous Afghan government. Um, but in reality, um, there are reports on the ground that uh, various journalists, um, members of the previous government have been targeted uh, in some way, or at least they're getting, you know, scary knocks on the door. Um, and uh, Frankly, you mentioned uh, that the, the safe passage for uh, U.S. citizens and other folks, uh, diplomats, to the airport. That's not something we are necessarily uh, seeing today because the Taliban have surrounded the Kabul airport um, with checkpoints. And we hear a lot of reports um, that people have not necessarily been able to get through. And there's just not a lot of clarity about how this is going to change going forward. Simone, what is the situation at the airport now, and what does this mean for evacuations? Yeah, well, I mentioned that there do seem to be checkpoints around um, around the entire uh, Hamid Karzai Airport co um, complex. While the situation in the airport itself is rather calm, there do seem to be uh, lots of people gathering outside. Um, the United States uh, White House has said 11,000 American citizens have essentially put up their hand and said, I'm here in Afghanistan. They're going to try and get those folks to the airport if they are in Kabul. But there are many times that a number of uh, people um, who are in, in some way associated uh, with the U.S. government, with the Afghan government, or with NGOs, and would have that visa and be able to go to the United States or elsewhere. Um, and it's really unclear how uh, the numbers make sense, how the, all those people are simply going to get to the airport to get on these flights to come here to Doha or elsewhere. Simone, thanks so much. Bloomberg Simone Foxman there in Doha. Now, coming up, a single case sends New Zealand into lockdown while the Texas governor tests positive as cases surge. We'll get into the diverging strategies to tackle COVID outbreaks. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. You know, there, there is a major split in how countries are tackling coronavirus outbreaks. New Zealand has largely managed to avoid COVID, but a single case has now sent the country into lockdown. Meanwhile, some U.S. states are taking the opposite approach. Texas Governor Greg Abbott has now tested positive amid a surge of cases in his state. Now, he reopened the Texas economy and lifted restrictions five months ago. Joining us now is Bloomberg's global biosecurity correspondent and senior editor Jason Gale in Melbourne. Jason, great to speak to you again. There are such diverging views on actually how to handle it and what the ethos of the country where you're in is. I mean, is there a right approach and a wrong approach, or is it, does it just depend on what you value most? <laughs> well, look, uh, the right approach is, uh, is vaccination, and clearly that is uh, a, a very important step in, in uh, ending the pandemic. But we know that vaccines alone are not enough. We know uh, from right at the beginning when the efficacy data came coming out was that they don't provide a perfect shield. And so uh, with Delta, um, which is even uh, uh, testing the limits of vaccine further, we know that we need to be doing more. We need to be wearing masks, maintaining social distance, uh, not gathering in large numbers, improving indoor ventilation. All of those things are going to be incredibly important in reducing the transmission of the Delta virus, Francine. Yeah, so, uh, Jason, if you look at what's happening in New Zealand, are they, are they trying to basically have, you know, zero COVID cases full stop, or is it until they have critical vaccination? At the moment, vaccination rates are not sufficient uh, to uh, do anything other than try to suppress the transmission of the, the, the Delta variant in the community. The problem with, um, with Delta Francine is that the, the virus, this particular variant, um, it replicates very, very fast, much faster than other variants. So uh, people are infectious earlier uh, than they were with previous um, variants, and that makes it much more difficult to, to do the contact tracing, to identify cases, and then the, the people who have been in contact with those cases and to prevent those chains of transmission. It's almost impossible uh, with Delta, uh, as health authorities here in Australia and New Zealand are 
uh, finding without instituting these lockdowns, which, quite frankly, everybody hates, but that seems to be the only way of um, stopping transmission uh, when you don't have sufficient levels of vaccination. Jason, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Jason Gale there. Now, we're also joined by Simon French, chief economist at Panmure Gordon. Simon, I know we're not virologists, or not all of us are virologists. Jason probably is. But when you look at, first of all, good morning. When you look at what the market is worrying about is, you know, the coronavirus hurting growth. I mean, we've been worrying about that for a year. Is anything changing or do market worries just reflect a bit of a, you know, lousy August day? Yeah, good morning, Francine. Well, I think the dynamic has changed. I think Jason captured it well regarding this race to be vaccinated, which clearly some of the countries that are pursuing a zero COVID strategy are behind on the vaccine rollout. And therefore, they have to play that strategy for, for, longer, for a longer period of time. But in terms of how our discussion we've had for more than a year about the impacts growth is, I don't think there is a trade-off between uh, growth and restrictions. I think that's a bit of a, a misnomer that's been allowed to be created. What you see is populations make their own judgment based on the data they see. Now, you could argue in New Zealand, you know, the economy uh, forefront of the you know, last 24 hours of news flow uh, are taking a very restrictive approach. But that is specific to the country and the geography in which they operate. It isn't going to be fit for purpose for the more integrated European, North American countries, but it works for them. And actually, you know, the economy has recovered pretty well and has managed to insulate through the actions of the central bank and the fiscal authorities from a closure of its international borders by insourcing a lot of domestic demand. Um, what does that mean, Simon, for actually, I mean, if you look at the hotspots for global growth, is, is there going to be a bifurcation on what growth, you know, where growth does better, not because of infection rates, but actually just on how they deal with lockdowns? Yeah, there was some interesting commentary, I thought, from the New Zealand Central Bank overnight defending their decision to uh, leave interest rates unchanged. They talked about, and I think this is the correct interpretation, that the economies have shown to deal with spikes in cases, in infections, and dealing with it at a localised level at short notice. And I think the real advice for investors, for your viewers this morning, is that it is that flexibility of economies to deal with temporary restrictions. And sectors that have adapted have shown experience over the last 12, 18 months of working, of operating within that environment, that's going to ultimately be the determinant of the medium-term growth performance of a lot of these countries. Those that have adapted well and found systems are going to outperform. Those that, uh, for, for a number of reasons, either infrastructure-wise, investment-wise, the public sector funding side, are unable to respond as quickly, I think that is as relevant, actually, as the vaccine rollout on their growth profile. Wonderful. Simon, thanks so much. Simon French there from ben Panmure Gordon stays with us. We'll talk a lot more about the UK. We'll talk about inflation and the FOMC minutes. In the meantime, we're also getting some breaking news at the top of the hour. This is a very important also conversation that we'll have with the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund chief executive. It returned $111 billion in the first half of the year. So we'll have plenty more, of course, on that. We'll look at uh, some of the strategies that worked, some of the ones that worked less for them. But overall, it does seem like it's a pretty good quarter to the year, and that means that they have a first half that's pretty impressive. Later today, we're also speaking with the head of Norway's Sovereign Wealth Fund, Nikolai Tangen. That's at 12.30 p.m. London time. Coming up, though, attention turns to the Federal Reserve minutes as Boston Fed Governor Rosengren says he would support tapering from next month. This is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Simone Foxman. Hi, Simone. Hi, Francine. South Korea wants to have 70% of its population vaccinated by the end of September, boosting rates that lag others in the region. In an exclusive interview with Bloomberg, Prime Minister Kim Bu-kyum 
says his government will continue aid to small businesses hurt by strict social distancing measures aimed at stemming a record COVID wave powered by the Delta variant. One of the reasons why we think South Korea has succeeded in prevention is because we didn't turn to extreme measures like lockdowns. Local officials in Haiti have raised the death toll from a magnitude 7.2 earthquake that struck the country over the weekend to more than 1,900. Rescue work has been hampered by heavy rains brought by Tropical Storm Grace. The U.S. National Hurricane Center said some places in Haiti have been hit by as much as 38 centimeters of rainfall. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. Francine. Simone, thank you so much. Now, the Boston Fed President, Eric Rosengren, says he would support tapering asset purchases from next month. He said that the emergency bond buying program is ill-suited for an economy held back by supply constraints. These words come ahead of today's release of minutes from the Federal Reserve's latest meeting and, of course, the Jackson Hole Conference next week. Well, Simon Friend from Panier Gordon is still with us. Simon, were you a little bit disappointed that we didn't get, you know, much from Jay Powell yesterday, or was he never going to front run Jackson Hole? I think you've answered your own question, Francine. I don't think he was going to run run Jackson Hole. And I don't think he's actually got uh, the critical mass on the FOMC, despite uh, Rosengren's comments, for a uh, aggressive move at Jackson Hole. I think while the most recent jobs report uh, was, was encouraging, I think the overall uh, trajectory of, of the Delta variant in the United States, um, the overall... Uh, picture regarding the flexible average inflation target and where expectations are means that I think the FOMC are going to wait until their December meeting. And um, Jackson Hole, dare I say, it will be framing for the framing. It will set the, the intellectual backdrop of where they are on the flexible average inflation target, probably offer a few nuggets to the market on how their definition of maximum employment has yeah. evolved over the last 12 months. But actually, I don't see the communications fundamentally shifting until December. I mean, Simon, it's very clear that Minneapolis's Neil Kashkari, you know, is very cautious about the future. And he said again that there will be broader economic implications about the Delta for the, for the U.S. I mean, is that your view as well? How early can we actually seriously think about Fed tapering? Well, Neil Kashkari is the perma-dove on the FMC. I don't think his comments should come as any great surprise. That doesn't mean that I don't have quite a lot of sympathy with him. I think he has been proved right during his tenure on the FOMC on a number of occasions, and I think his warning is, is well made. I think the, the points that I would make in terms of tapering, it's not clear to me across the whole envelope of asset purchases, the $120 billion, that the ongoing purchases of mortgage-backed securities are justified, given where long rates are in the mortgage market. Does the Federal Reserve feel that continuing to add to their stock of purchases is, is um, providing financing, uh, competitive financing conditions to the real estate market that otherwise wouldn't be there. I'm, I'm far, than, far from convinced that that is the case. And therefore, there is possibly a, a halfway house here, which is the mortgage-backed securities element of the $120 billion envelope tapers somewhat earlier than the Treasury's purchases. Simon, what's your take on the UK inflation reading today? Yeah, so to be expected that inflation in near term is going to pull back. There's a lot of lumpy data, not just in the UK, but globally in the inflation year on year comparisons. July was quite strong in 2020 amidst what was a weak inflationary picture. I think what we'll see is a strong, a really strong rebound in UK inflation in the August print in a month's time because the what was known as the eat out to help out scheme here in the UK, which suppressed the costs of uh, eating out hospitality because of a, a government subsidy. That's going to come into the August data, meaning we'll go back from about 2 percent up to near enough 3 percent and stay high, I think, for a couple of quarters before it starts to come back on a more sustainable basis at the end of Q1 2022. I mean, will there be limits actually to what, you know, if there are limits to what central banks can do, and there must be, of course, are the markets going to feel it? Are you expecting some kind of catalytic co correction? Well, 
I think uh, Danny at the top of the hour was talking about the VIX uh, and you know investors taking protection uh, into some potential volatility as that communications message that we spoke about that's not just relevant to the Fed but to all central banks. There's a potential for a policy mistake, perhaps not a material policy mistake, perhaps a communications policy mistake, which is of course part of the toolkit. And I think that is one of the reasons why uh, we've seen uh, volumes in markets across all um, capital markets reduced down because it was such a strong H1 that a lot of mm -hmm. fund managers, portfolio managers, are actually taking insurance through what are going to be thin uh, volumes for the next few weeks during the summer break, but then also into the you know the fourth quarter, trying to preserve some of those really strong gains. So I think that is uh, both the seasonal effect and also the risk of bungled communications is one of the reasons there's a more cautious standing at the moment. Simon, thank you so much. Simon French, their chief economist at Panyur Gordon, joining us this morning. Now, as the Taliban leadership in exile returns to Afghanistan, European leaders express frustration at President Biden's decision to pull out U.S. troops out of the country. Up next, we speak to the deputy chair of the CDU parliamentary group. That's coming up next. And then we look at a full roundup, of course, of the markets. Today, we're expecting FOMC, and then the focus will be on inflation. This is Bloomberg. The Taliban leadership in exile returns to Afghanistan. The White House says it's in contact with the militant group to allow safe passage through the airport. COVID cases rise in lockdown Australia and New Zealand. The RBNZ holds steady on rates, worried about the impact of the outbreak. Attention turns to today's Fed Minutes. Plus, wildfires rage through France and Spain. More than 10,000 people are evacuated from the Saint-Tropez region. What role can finance actually play in mitigating the climate crisis. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Wednesday, 18th of August. Now, stocks, U.S. stocks actually posting their biggest decline in a month amid growth and virus concerns after a positive session through much of Asia, European equities and U.S. futures are searching for a direction. Attention turns to Jackson Hole Symposium next week, which may offer clues on when and how the central bank will taper bond purchases. Let's get straight to our top story with our Danny Berger. Danny, first of all, what are you seeing on the markets? I mean, it feels like it's, you know, markets are a little bit directionless, trying yeah. to look at inflation. They're trying to figure out what, you know, the Delta variant means for growth yet again. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, there are just so many risks in this market. And we were talking about earlier how it's the summer months. And so that gives us the opportunity for volatility to move higher. So because of that, it's a really just, as you say, directionless market. But if anything, the bias is towards one of being more somber. We're continuing to see U.S. futures drop after that session yesterday of falling seven-tenths of one percent, the biggest fall in a month. Europe not doing all that much better, too. So underneath the surface of these moves, we continue to see investors going towards Haven. Gold being one of them up about one-tenth of one percent. Also really remarkable for Francine Palantir, the tech company, the big data company, buying $51 million worth of gold, saying that they are preparing for a black swan event. So that gives you an idea of how some corporations and market participants are viewing the state of play right now, now not to mention things like Afghanistan and, and geopolitical concerns as well. And we do have a VIX that is moving higher yet again, Francine, uh, volatility about the highest in two weeks. Danny, thank you so much. Our Danny Berger there with the very latest, of course, on some of these markets. Now, European leaders have expressed their frustrations at President Biden's decision to pull out the remaining U.S. troops from Afghanistan. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel also says the NATO mission there was fundamentally dependent on the Americans. France's Emmanuel Macron stressed the Taliban to Kabul in a matter of hours with no resistance. Now, the White House is still insisting that they did not foresee Afghanistan falling so quickly to the Taliban. We were clear-eyed going in when we made this decision that it was possible that the Taliban would end up in control of Afghanistan. We were clear-eyed about that. Now, as the president said in his remarks yesterday, we did not anticipate that it would happen at this speed, though we were planning for these potential contingencies. Well, joining us now is Johan Vadepol. He is the deputy chair of the CDU CSU parliamentary group. Mr. Vadepol, thank you so much for joining us here on Bloomberg Good Surveillance. Morning. What is the one thing that actually Europe and maybe some NATO allies can do now to help Afghanistan? 
Yes, we're trying to, 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 to get our personnel out of Afghanistan. Um, of course, uh, first of all, the German ones, uh, the, the NATO personnel, and of course, the people from Afghanistan who helped us uh, uh, providing the, the military actions uh, within Afghanistan. And of course, it was uh, surprising for us that Kabul fell uh, so quickly uh, in, into the Taliban hands. But uh, this, of course, was the result of a development which began in spring when uh, the U.S. administration, when uh, uh, President Biden decided to leave the country without any conditions. And uh, when then uh, the intelligence information from uh, the United States uh, one or two weeks ago were released that uh, uh, the Taliban only need some 30 days uh, uh, to capture uh, uh, Kabul, okay, that, that uh, knocked out uh, uh, the army uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. That, that, that brought uh, the, the, the will of, of Afghans down uh, to fight against the Taliban. Mr. Radiful, can you clarify what you're expecting to address in today's extraordinary committee meetings? So our, 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 uh, we, we would like in, in these days, we try to, to save as much lives as possible. And we're trying to work together with the uh, United States uh, as closely as, as ever possible, as we did in the last 20 years. So there are a lot of expectations uh, on Germany uh, if it comes to questions of defense. We have to spend 2 percent of the GDP and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, all absolutely correct. But uh, in my eyes, uh, in the last time, uh, the United States did not see uh, that the Germany stood with uh, the second largest troop contingent uh, together with the United States in Afghanistan, that we work closely together with the U.S. And uh, nobody asked us whether it was a good idea to leave that country in such a quick way. So uh, the, the very uh, irritating situation we do now have, the chaos we, we are facing in Kabul, uh, is, of course, the result of this. Germany was ready to stay there for a little bit longer, for so, perhaps two, three Mr. years. Uh, and But unfortunately, there was no political will in Washington to do so. So what should we actually learn? What should Germany learn from this chaos in Afghanistan? Are, are you questioning the communication between NATO members? I'm, I'm questioning the decision uh, in principle. Uh, whether it uh, hadn't been more intelligent to, to negotiate a little bit longer in Doha and, and keeping uh, a military pressure on the Taliban uh, in Afghanistan. And, of course, I'm questioning the communication. Nobody told us that, uh, that we are together. Of course, if the U.S. leaves, we also have to leave, uh, that we had to leave uh, in September. Then it was uh, two months uh, earlier. We had to leave in the beginning of July. So there was no reliance uh, uh, on, on, uh, uh, on, on the, the, the timetable. And uh, so if, you, if the alliance is not clear, if we were not clear to say under which conditions and in, in, in which time we would leave Afghanistan, yeah. The, the trust on the other side uh, uh, in, in, in the Afghan uh, army also uh, fell down. Uh, Mr. Vadafoul, many people are asking what the role of Germany will be in foreign relations in the future. Does Afghanistan, you know, maybe mark a turning point of Germany be, being more at the forefront of foreign affairs, also, you know, taking on allies, but being a leader in this? Yes, of course. Uh, we, we will have to rethink uh, all of this. Uh, we are engaged uh, uh, in uh, uh, Africa, in the Sahel zone, uh, in Mali and in other neighboring uh, countries. We are taking responsibility there, together with uh, France, especially, and other European partners. 
And of course, it's absolutely clear this, that Germany has to do more in uh, questions of foreign affairs and uh, foreign security uh, uh, questions uh, in our neighborhood. It's absolutely clear that we have to acknowledge that uh, the United States will no longer be the policeman of the world and help us uh, to, to live here secure in Europe. We have to do more. But uh, may I remind you that this is a long path for a Germany uh, which has been educated since the Second World War mm -hmm. to abstain from using military power. Johan, thank you so much for joining us. Mr. Johan Vadepoel there, a deputy chair of the CDU-CSU parliamentary group, joining us this morning. Now, in the meantime, the UK House of Commons are now debating Afghanistan. It's the first time Parliament's been open since restrictions have actually been lifted. Parliament has been recalled. The Prime Minister is about to open a debate in the House of Commons about the situation in Afghanistan. Here's the Prime Minister. Thanking you and all the parliamentary staff for enabling us to meet this morning. Before I turn to today's debate, I'm sure the House will want to join you, Mr Speaker, and me in sending our condolences to the family and friends of those killed in the appalling shooting in Plymouth last week. Investigations are, of course, continuing, but we will learn every possible lesson from this tragedy. Mr Speaker, I know that members across the House share my concern about the situation in Afghanistan, the issues it raises for our own security, and the fears of many remaining in that country, especially women and children. The sacrifice in Afghanistan is seared into our national consciousness, with 150,000 people serving there from across the length and breadth of the United Kingdom, including a number of members on all sides of the House whose voices will be particularly important today. And so it's absolutely right that we should come together for this debate. And, Mr Speaker, yes, I uh, will certainly give way to my honourable friend. I thank the Prime Minister for giving way. As someone who opposed this nation-building intervention, it now brings its responsibilities. In, or in addition to getting our nationals out safely, Live pictures there from Westminster, the House of Commons, where Parliament has been recalled, and we just heard there from the Prime Minister talking about Afghanistan. We know that uh, Mr. Johnson spoke to the U.S. President Joe Biden yesterday evening about the evacuation of Kabul. We'll have plenty more, of course, on Afghanistan. We're also just getting some uh, breaking news out of Tencent. If you look at sales, they rose to around 138 billion yuan. I have to say the results are out. Revenue seems to be in line with estimates, judging at least from the first couple of headlines. So we'll have plenty more on the Tencent, second quarter revenue. Again, this is a story of crackdown and regulation in China. Coming up, extreme weather events create more urgency to in tackling the climate crisis. The role of sustainable finance in challenging the climate crisis is up next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, firefighters are struggling to contain wildfires in France's Gulf of Saint-Tropez and the Spanish province of Avila. More than 10,000 people have been evacuated in southern France, and the blaze in Spain has so far consumed at least 15,000 hectares of forest. After last week's damning report from the IPCC, attention has turned more than ever to solutions rather than the causes of climate change. While sustainable finance could be the driving force behind many of the solutions, and Mirova, an affiliate of Netixis, with more than 20 billion pounds under management specializes in the sector. Well, we're joined by Philippe Zawati, or Zawati uh, the chief executive of Morova, who joins us now. Philippe, thank you so much uh, for joining us. You've dedicated the last decade of your career investing in sustainability. You also contributed to the writing of Emmanuel Macron's presidential program on the environment and wrote several books, including Sustainable Finance, Ringing in a Second Chance. What role can finance today play? Uh, a, a huge role, a very important role, because uh, uh, I mean, not only finance, but uh, we uh, we need to to completely uh, transform the the economy. Uh, the 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 result that we are seeing today is a result of the of the economy of the past, and today finance can be a very uh, very huge 
uh, uh, lever to uh, to change the way we are producing and, and consuming goods. Uh, we, we need to invest a lot if we want to transform the economy and to, uh, and to go to, uh, to carbon neutrality uh, in, in the coming decades. Uh, that means uh, huge investments in new technology, in, uh, uh, in renewable energy, in, of course, uh, uh, clean transportation, uh, in uh, uh, the transformation of, of, of the agriculture as well. Uh, all this uh, needs uh, uh, a lot of financing, but we also need to uh, to change, also to transform uh, the, uh, the, the the players uh, of the old economy. I would say of the, the carbon-intensive economy, uh, and that will need also uh, a lot of investments uh, to transform the, uh, the this carbon-intensive economy. And uh, and so this is uh, of course uh, something at the at the public level and at the private level as well. But, uh, Philippe, is there a danger that actually going through finance, the money doesn't actually really change habits, so that we're still financing, for example, fossil fuels at the margins? So what are the limits of finance, and how do you think it will change in the next 12 months? There, there are a lot of different uh, uh, levers, and the first one, of course, is regulation. Uh, what we have seen in, in, uh, in, in Europe uh, the, the last uh, couple of years is a very strong uh, evolution of, uh, of, the, uh, of the regulation and uh, the, uh, the will to create at the European level uh, a, a green, uh, uh, green uh, market union uh, is something very important. It started a couple of years ago with the Sustainable Finance uh, Action Plan of the EU uh, and especially mm -hmm. with the creation of the taxonomy so this taxonomy is a kind of a grammar of sustainable finance. It defines what is green and what is not green, and it will help investors to channel the money into the, into the, green, the green economy. Yeah. Uh, we have also creation of labels and standards in order to help the, the savers to, to direct their, 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 their savings into, uh, into that direction. So if you look uh, at so you know, we, the possibility, we, Philippe, if you look at the possibility of a green capital markets union, I mean, yeah. what does that is that does that need to be incorporated in the capital markets union? Is that something that actually, you know, regulators and authorities in Europe are really thinking about? You know, what what's interesting is that uh, five years ago, uh, um, I, I was speaking about the capital market unions, and there was nothing about sustainability in in the uh, in the CMU project. It was only uh, only about I mean. Uh, uh, intensifying the, uh, the the financing of the uh, of the European uh, economy, but nothing about sustainability. And today, that's exactly the other way around. Uh, we, we we start with the green deal, with how uh, how shall we finance the green deal? How, fi how shall we finance the uh, let's say, for example, the uh, uh, hydrogen business and uh, and so on and so forth? And and how the CMU and the Capital Market Union could help to do this. So uh, the, the, the hierarchy of, of the thinking at the, uh, European level, uh, at the European Union level has completely changed, and it's uh, uh, the other way around that five years ago. Philippe, how do you so, think the financing uh, actually will change? Philippe, how do Sorry. you think the financing will change in uh, some of these markets? Is you know money going to be? It's gone into a lot of ESG bonds and green financing. Is there going to be a if more sophisticated get, level to example, make sure? Yes, yeah, to make yeah, sure that we don't do greenwashing. Yeah, the, the, the greenwashing question is very important, of course. But let, let's look at, at uh, the uh, new regulation, which is called the SFDR, uh, which uh, uh, defined uh, um, in these. Uh, Article 8 and Article 9, uh, the, the products which are uh, uh, sustainable, I mean, uh, the responsible investment products. And, and so all the investment funds in the EU uh, had to uh, uh, declare uh, within, um, uh, I mean, whether they are uh, in this category or not. And one third of the, pro of the investment funds has, has decided to put themselves in this category, in this responsible investments category. So we, we can say that one third today of the investment funds managed in Europe at least incorporate uh, environmental and social and governance criteria into, uh, into their, their, their management. So that's a very important point. That means that uh, the, 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 all of the industry is completely changing. But of course, within this third uh, of investment funds, uh, there are different things. And, and greenwashing is, mm -hmm. of course, a thing very important to tackle. Uh, but uh, all the transparency uh, uh, regulation requirements, which are uh, today uh, uh, put in place by the European Commission, are clearly going into, right. into, into, into the, the, the good Philippe, direction. 
I mean, you have so, so much under, you know, assets under management. Where is the most yeah. appetite for green financing coming from? Is there a part of the world? Is it Europe? Is it European investors? Is it the U.S.? Is it Asia? Uh, it's, uh, uh, of course, it was mainly Europe. Uh, but we have also started to uh, to develop our business in the U.S. Uh, five years ago. And today, the momentum is very strong in the U.S. as well. Uh, and, and we see Asia starting, uh, of course. It's uh, it's emerging in Asia. Um, but uh, today, yes. Uh, and, and the other interesting thing is, is that a couple of years ago, uh, most of the demand w was coming from uh, big institutional investors, insurance companies, pension funds, and so on. And today, we uh, in the last couple of years, we have seen a very strong growth uh, in uh, on the retail side uh, and especially on the on, on private banking side uh, and uh, mm -hmm. a, a big part of our assets are coming uh, uh, from uh, high uh, high net worth uh, private investors today wonderful thank you so much for joining us this morning for a really interesting and important conversation philippe zawati there the chief executive of mirova now the pass rate for the chartered financial analyst level one exam has hit the lowest since testing began in 1963. Only 25% of applicants actually passed the latest test, down from the average rate of 42%. Now, passing all three CFA exams can lead to higher salaries, but also better job opportunities. Candidates, on average, study 300 hours for each level and take four years to complete the series. Some are now wondering if it's worth the time. Well, one of them is Daily Dirt Nap editor Jared Dillian, Writing for Bloomberg Opinion, he argues that the CFA program is actually a colossal waste of time. You can read his piece in full on OPNI Go on the Bloomberg and, of course, on Bloomberg.com. Well, joining us now is our Markets Live editor and recent CFA candidate, Eddie. First of all, I mean, 300, I, I you know, congratulate you because you're one of the 25% that actually passed, but also you studied for it 300 hours, and I'm sorry to have to remind you. <laughs> I mean, you, I don't know if you enjoyed it, but certainly you found it valuable. Uh, absolutely, I have. Look, I, 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 found, I found that a really insightful piece. I'll say that first of all. I, I have a lot of respect for Jared, and I think he, he, he struck some really interesting points about the scope of the CFA exams. And one thing he's definitely right about is it takes a lot of time, right? Um, you say 300 hours for the, for, the, for the level three. I certainly studied an awful lot more, of, more than that. But, you know, somebody who's a little bit smarter may not have needed to study quite as much for the exam. But certainly you need to cover a lot of material in order to get through this exam and it's important to know what the CFA is and what it isn't right and uh, it, it doesn't really prepare you you know if, if a candidate goes in thinking they're gonna be a, a senior hedge fund manager coming out of it I'm sorry but you're just not this is an entry-level <sighs> exam um, you know there's a lot more that you need to do to prove yourself in today's finance world but it's a good it's a good start all right, on to the markets. I mean, it is one of our most read stories, actually, and I urge everyone to go and have a look because it's interesting for those who passed the CFA and those that didn't. And to Eddie, what's on your mind in terms of markets? I imagine minutes and inflation. Yeah, minutes and inflation, you're absolutely right. I, I think, you know, the markets are a little bit stable today. We've had a little bit of a pullback in Europe in recent sessions after this phenomenal run up. Um, it's, it's seemingly markets are more and more disconnected from fundamentals, which the CFA candidates will uh, be, be a little bit frustrated by. Um, but look, I think, I think it's, it's just it's interesting to see just where markets are going as we see the minutes today. But I think the really big one is going to be uh, Jackson Hole at the end of the month. Yeah, what are you expecting from Jackson Hole? Is there a worry that actually we're not going to hurt? I mean, I know that there w it was very unlikely that actually Jay Powell would have front run Jackson Hole with an important speech on tapering yesterday. But if we don't, what if we don't get much in Jackson Hole either? You know, Jackson Hole is really important not not just because of you know who is speaking, but also because who is watching and what people expect from it. People go into Jackson Hole thinking this is going to be the policy setting, agenda setting, you know, moment of the year. And therefore, if everything that anybody says just carries that much more weight. And there's scope for surprises there. I think we really, we are waiting to see whether there is a rebalance between, you know, worries about inflation and worries about, you know, the Delta variants and, and, and growth and so on. And I, I think Jackson Hole, the absolute perfect uh, opportunity for central bankers to give us more of a view on that. 
It, what about, is there anything else, Eddie, that you're looking at? I know there was a, a couple of stories on the VIX, or I don't know whether you're looking at gold. Yeah, yeah. D look, the VIX is really interesting. I think for me, my eyes are still very much on, on crude prices. Crude price prices have come back a lot. Crude prices, of course, you know, and commodity prices generally, uh, important in driving inflation. And I think we may just go into Jackson Hole with inflation, f inflationary pressures coming off a little bit because in commodity prices are softening. And that's because China is slowing and that's because we in the West are pivoting towards the services rather than a, a you know pure um, growth based uh, on goods so I think that's that's really interesting as we go towards the end of the month all right thanks so much our markets live editor and recent CFA candidate again congratulations are Eddie van der Valt in the meantime we're looking at the UK House of Commons where members have been recalled and are now debating Afghanistan this is the first time Parliament's been open since restrictions have actually been lifted. They had to be recalled for their summer recess. Uh, Boris Johnson addressing their parliament, uh, promising that up to 5,000 Afghans can actually find refuge in the UK this year, with up to 20,000 in the longer term. A lot of questions, of course, will also be asked on communication between the US and some of their main NATO allies. We had an interesting conversation with the CDU member just a short while ago, saying maybe it will also lead Germany to take a more active role in foreign policy. I wonder whether it will be the same for the UK. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller joins me out of Berlin. Katie Lines out of New York. We'll have a full roundup of Afghanistan, the markets. We'll look at FOMC minutes a little bit later on. We'll also talk about China and Tencent. This is Bloomberg. As far as the dialogue and the consultation is happening, you know, I think it's a little bit disingenuous of the, of the U.S. administration right now to say they had nothing to do with this because they, in fact, were the ones who facilitated the Taliban's return. We were clear-eyed going in when we made this decision that it was possible that the Taliban would end up in control of Afghanistan. We were clear-eyed about that. NATO's focus right now is to ensure the safe departure of personnel from allied and partner countries and of the Afghans who have helped us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua, Matt Miller and Keely Lines. It's 10 a.m. here in London, 11 a.m. in Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Wednesday, August 18th. Our top stories today. Safe passage. The U.S. says it has to deal with the Taliban to allow Americans to get to Kabul airport so they can evacuate. Retail therapy Target and Lowe's report earnings today after a mixed bag of results from Walmart and Home Depot. And Wall Street tightens up while the coronavirus surge is prompting Goldman Sachs to consider a mask mandate at work. Meanwhile, Morgan Stanley will now require workers to show proof that they're vaccinated. Now, if you look at the markets, they're trading kind of trading sideways, Kelly. So although they're, you know, they may be preparing for some kind of option expiration, maybe they're looking at virus resurgence or it's just a quirky August day, a little bit directionless in today's trading session. Yeah, or we're all just waiting and watching for Jackson Hole that will be taking place in just <laughs> over a week, Francine. I will say it was a little bit more decisive in the Asian session in that it actually was positive. Green really all across the screen from Korea to Japan to China and Hong Kong. A difference from what we've seen in the past couple of days. Actually, the MSCI Asia Pacific Index rose by a few tenths of 1%. It's first day higher after a four day losing streak. So maybe a little bit of dip buying coming in in Asia. Of course, one individual stock in Asia we've been paying attention to is Tencent. It changed or it ended the day three tenths of one percent higher, but that was before it released results after the market closed in Asia. It did show a slowdown in gaming growth, so we'll have to see how that stock reacts in tomorrow's session. It's already down more than 40 percent from its peak earlier on this year. Of course, the other news out of the region overnight was from New Zealand. The central bank out with a surprise rate hold. It was expected to hike, but the lockdown because of a resurgence in coronavirus cases, and by that I mean exactly seven cases threw a little bit of a wrench into that plan that the central bank says they still plan to tighten eventually. So that is whipsawed the New Zealand dollar. Right now it is uh, stronger against the U.S. dollar or weaker, excuse me, by about a tenth of one percent.
As for the picture here in the U.S., it has been, as Francine says, a little bit directionless this morning, fluctuating between gains and losses. Right now, we are in negative territory, down by about a tenth of 1% on S&P 500 futures after the index fell from a record high yesterday. In the bond market, not a lot of movement. We're essentially unchanged on the U.S. 10-year yield, sitting right around 126. It is a weaker dollar story broadly in the G10 space today, and that may be a bit helping oil. It, of course, is fresh off its worst losing streak since March, down four days in a row, but this morning, WTI futures up about six tenths of 1%, Matt. All right, we have a pretty mixed picture in terms of what's going on here in Europe, Kaylee. Take a look at the map and you'll see a lot of gray, um, some green on the screen, a little bit of red there. So um, sort of struggling for direction, but I guess moving a bit to the downside. If you take a look at the broader stocks 600, you can see that it's moving a little bit lower right now, even though you have gains in Switzerland, even though you have gains in Austria. Um, you can also take a look at the uh, Bund's negative 48 basis points, and we're looking at the pound as well. The pound gaining against the dollar, but still below $1.38 at 137.57. And I like to show Brent crude because it is the global benchmark um, creeping back up towards $70 a barrel. So right now it's $69.56, but it does look like Francine, these markets are looking for some direction looking for some catalyst to move in one way or the other. Yeah, they are, Matt. You know what also caught my attention is actually the VIX. Volatility could be, I know it's from a low base, but something that maybe we should keep an eye on. Yeah, absolutely. And gold, I think, is interesting. You know, there's a great story overnight about Palantir. They bought apparently $50 million worth of gold bars. I always love the idea of these 100-ounce gold bars <laughs> going for $178,000 a piece. And they're now willing to accept... Uh, pay not only in Bitcoin um, as well as dollars, but in gold for in their gold software well. services. Yeah, exactly. So if you need some software yeah. action from Palantir, you can just get a gold bar and hand it over to them and they'll deliver. Perfect. Perfect for the Miller Vault. Let's also look at uh, what's ahead today. The EIA releases its crude oil inventory report at 10.30 a.m. New York time. 2 p.m. we'll get the minutes from the FOMC's latest meeting. Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan and St. Louis Fed President James Bullard also speak today. And finally, more retail earnings with Lowe's, Target and TGX due a little bit later. Now over to Afghanistan and the Taliban have told U.S. diplomats that they will allow for safe passage to the airport in Kabul. The White House is now urging Americans Americans in the besieged city to head there for transport out of Afghanistan. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan spoke at a briefing yesterday. We are engaging diplomatically at the same time with allies in regional countries and with the United Nations to address the situation in Afghanistan. We are in contact with the Taliban to ensure the safe passage of people to the airport. Let's go straight to Anne-Marie Hordern, who was in that briefing, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joining us from D.C. Anne-Marie, is there a, a, a trust at all from D.C. that they can actually take what the Taliban are saying at face value? Mm. It's a very good question, Francine. The track record and the history of the Taliban certainly does not support that they could potentially take what the Taliban is saying at face value. And while you do have the United States saying that they are in contact, and at the moment, we do see personnel, more than 3,000 people have been able to uh, be evacuated from the United States side, um, as well as some 2,000 Afghan um, immigrants wanting to come to the United States. There is uh, reports the Taliban is also setting up security checkpoints around the airports. So that's something that we're going to have to be watching every single day as this unfolds. Um, the President of the United States, we should mention, has come under immense pressure for what unfolded over the weekend. He is actually back at the White House now. He was at camp. David. And yesterday we tried to get a sense from the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan about what actually unfolded the timeline of this. And when I asked them about this, Mr. Sullivan said that on Thursday, the President of the United States did in fact give the order for more troops, given the deteriorating situation on the ground. So I followed up with if he knew on Thursday about this situation, why did he leave the White House on Friday? Take a listen. He was monitoring developments hour by hour throughout that entire time and has been making a series of decisions about troop deployments, uh, giving us direction and guidance about how to take the shape of this mission and make sure that we're executing it, and at every turn asking our military who is leading this mission and executing this mission with bravery and valor, what do you need? I will get you anything you need. He asked that question multiple times every single day. 
Another major point to bring up out of that briefing is that August 31st deadline. Yeah. Um, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan was questioned about what happens if not all personnel is evacuated in time, and they say they are just taking it day by day and focusing on the task at hand. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Anne Marie, because of course there, we saw a letter from more than 40 members of the House on both sides of the political spectrum saying you need to make sure we get all of our troops and our Afghan allies out of there before we leave. So is that August 31st deadline very much in flux at the moment? It's certainly in focus, unsure if, if it's in flux. The National Security Advisor would not say whether or not it's going to be extended or not. He didn't want to get into hypotheticals. And uh, him and the Press Secretary, Jen Psaki, also said that they are just focused on the task at hand. Um, it would be in incredible, though, if the United States still had people there and decided because of a deadline, a date, they were not going to get them out. But I imagine this is something uh, throughout the next coming days and weeks that is going to be a, a ton of attention and focus on. All right, Anne-Marie, thanks very much. Anne-Marie Horton there out of Washington, D.C. Let's get to Wall Street now. Banks revising the rules again for returning to offices at Goldman Sachs. Talk center around asking staff to wear staff to wear masks at work. Morgan Stanley just informed the staff they must provide proof of vaccinations. The honor system no longer uh, flies. Let's get more on this with Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Danny? Matt, well, the issue at hand for these banks a lot is a lot of them were very bullish in getting their employees back to the office. Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, for example, both of them were really early on this trend. But confronting the new reality of Delta means that if they're back in the office, you need to make some changes to make sure your staff isn't catching COVID. Now, a lot of this is very common sense. Like you said, Goldman Sachs mulling the idea of having their employees wear masks again, doing spot checks uh, for positive COVID tests. Morgan Stanley, they they're proof of vaccination, so they haven't asked staff to fully come back in yet. But earlier in the month, you'll recall, they did have two staff members who tested positive for COVID, despite the fact that they were fully vaccinated. So again, it might be this sort of liability question is if you have people in, you need to be taking these steps to prevent the spread of Delta variant. Well, and of course, Danny, these banks operate where you are in London as well. And in that area of the world, it's basically just the regulations and the restrictions around mass and vaccines are unchanged from what they already were, right? That, that certainly is part of it. But Kaylee, I will say that we had, you know, so-called Freedom Day here in the UK, whether it was that or not, means that some of those mass mandates have been lifted. But I think it's maybe more of a cultural thing that there's more hybrid working here. Uh, certainly in these banks offices in London, you can still see people wearing masks. So they haven't yet changed uh, here in the UK and really for most of Europe. So it really is Wall Street that's been taking the lead, but perhaps they acted a little too soon because those offices might start soon looking like the ones here in London. Danny, thank you so much. Our Danny Berger there with the very latest on some of these staff moves. Now, tech giant Tencent reporting revenue today that met estimates. China's expanding tech crackdown, of course, overshadowing newer businesses like cloud and social ads. Well, joining us now from Hong Kong is Matthew Canterman, Bloomberg Intelligence tech analyst. Actually, Matthew, so it wasn't as bad as we were expecting, but still, year to date, down 43% in terms of value. Yeah, I mean, the numbers were pretty much spot on with consensus, which I guess you could say is good considering the stock down so much. It was probably worse priced in than that, right? But, um, you know, you know, the, uh, the, the ad business was a, bit, was a bit weaker than expected. Some of the new businesses like fintech and business services were a bit stronger than expected. Gaming was down year on year, but that was largely expected because, you know, even though Tencent has a large China gaming business, they have a global footprint. In the second quarter of last year was really the, uh, you know, the bulk of lockdowns in the West. And so the Western gaming business of, of them, you know, is huge high base last year. Um, you know, so, you know, all, all things considered pretty much what we expected. Is the pain for Tencent shares then over, Matt? I don't think so. I, I think with the regulatory headwinds swirling, we're seeing more regulatory headlines. As literally, the second the press release for earnings comes out, there's headlines from the MIT in China, uh, you know, saying they have to fix some apps for privacy issues. So, you know, I, I think there's lots more in terms of the headwinds to come. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, every time there's been a, a negative headline, the stock has fallen pretty sharply. So, um, I, I would be reluctant to try to, you know, call the bottom here and, and say it's time to buy the dip. I think that. You know, if you have a long-term horizon, this is a structurally sound business. They're going to protect a pretty much monopoly in several sectors. It's just the growth uh, of that business longer term and the cost structure are going to be worse than what we thought. 
All right, Matthew Canterman of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you so much. And speaking of stocks and the way they are moving, let's take a look at some U.S. shares and how they're trading in free market trading here in the U.S. I wanted to point out vaccine makers because, of course, Moderna last week was under some pretty intense pressure. Then yesterday we got reports that the U.S. is ready to outline guidelines for those third booster shots. That lifted Moderna more than 7% yesterday, and those gains are continuing this morning, up about 1.3% before the bell. Another stock moving to the upside is Tilray, of course, the cannabis company. It announced over that it has made, uh, acquired a majority position in convertible notes in MedMen when they be when they are able to convert those notes into equity after the passage of U.S. marijuana legislation. That could provide a big boon for the company, and the stock is up 6.7 percent as a result. And finally, one more mover to the upside is 23andMe. It was up 13 percent yesterday after getting a buy rating over at Credit Suisse, and investors are continuing to bid up those shares in early hours, up about four and a quarter percent before the bell, Francie. Yeah, there you go. 23andMe. I once gave away my DNA. It's a story for another time, but actually they're doing some fantastic work in terms of genetics. Coming up, Max Kettner, HSBC multi-asset strategist. And then a little bit later, we'll also be speaking to Ed Clissold, Ned Davis Research Chief U.S. Strategist. That's all about Jay Powell and inflation. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in Berlin with Francine Lacroix in London and Kaylee Lines in New York. Joining us now is Max Kettner, multi-asset strategist at HSBC, also coming from somewhere in the Federal Republic of Germany. Max, uh, let me ask you about these <laughs> markets and the fear of COVID. Is it creeping back in? Is that, you think, the reason for the recent downturn? Well, it is a little bit, but I think uh, people are making their lives a little bit too easy if they just focus on the Delta variant. So that's that's what we're hearing a lot right now. Had it not been for the Delta variant, we wouldn't have needed to revise our forecast slower. Well, actually, if we look at you know most of our um, global growth models, actually growth momentum has been rolling over since May already. So it's not just due to the Delta variant. It's been going on since the middle of Q2 already that growth momentum has been incrementally lost. Now, Delta is adding another further complication to it. And that, you know, when we look at, let's say, for example, the extent of global growth forecast revisions over the last couple, let's say, three to six months, They've been basically at a post-financial crisis high. That is really at risk, and that puts some of the early cyclical trades really at risk, and that's why we're still saying, look, you've got to stay with growth, with quality, with mm. carry assets, but it's too soon really yeah. to go back into sort of reopening and early cyclical trades. But so, Max, what's the one thing, if you look at inflation, right, what's the one thing that could actually scupper that? Well, I think I think on inflation, we're, we're, it's pretty clear that when we look at the last print, that you know the transitory nature is increasingly coming through. And I think one thing that is underestimated is how there is actually a pretty positive correlation between inflation surprises and actual inflation prints. Meaning that you know when there's very positive base effects like we've had in the first half of the year, economists tend to have a pretty tricky time to factor them in appropriately, and they keep being surprised on the upside. But conversely, they also have a pretty tricky time to really factor in the unwinding of those base effects, what we're going to see probably in the next six to 12 months, which means yeah. actually there could be a bit of downside surprises in inflation, which yeah. really no one is expecting at the moment. So, Max, it's hard for economists to forecast what inflation is going to do. It's also hard for strategists to forecast what we're going to see in the bond market. Bank of America yesterday putting out a research note saying they see a 100 basis point range for where the 10-year could be at year end between below 1% and up to 2%. Can you make any kind of call with conviction on Treasuries right now? Yeah, I think, I mean, our rates guys are still calling uh, for 1% 1, 1 by the end of the year. And we are still overweight, actually very much so, in our allocation and duration through being overweight in investment grade credit, in, 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 in treasuries outright, in uh, emerging market hard currency debt with a duration of around nine. So we actually did like and still do like duration quite a lot. First, because it continues Max, to what be if the, the pain trade. It, what if, it what if the taper kicks off, Max? Yeah, I guess 
I guess tapering is a little bit overblown. I mean, there's there's too much really uh, being being factored in. I think for for the rates call. I think what is more at risk is perhaps some of the risk assets, so equities, perhaps a little bit credit. I think what's really at risk if the Fed does taper too aggressively, if also the pace, not only of the announcement but also Max. the pace of ta tapering. Is, is better it's, than in 2014 or faster than in 2014, then it's going to be a bit tricky for US equities in particular. It feels like we're on a threshold of a major bifurcation of scenarios for markets. No, oh, bifurcation has been called. <laughs> Yeah, th there is. I think the 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 bifurcation. I mean, that's that's sort of the, the the call for regime changes, right? Which we I think we haven't been short of those calls for the last 12 months. I'm not particularly sure. I mean, first, you know, with the inflation, for example, that very much comes down now. That very much we see that sort of transitory nature coming through. We shouldn't forget that most of those supply side bottlenecks are hugely transitory in nature, right? We cannot call that things like, let's say, Taiwan having the worst drought in 60 years and that hugely impacting the chip shortage, right? That that is something that is lasting, that that's going to call a regime change. I, I'm not particularly sure, right? Yeah. There, there's an awful lot of stories being made out of that. But a bifurcation or regime change, I'm not a pit, particularly great fan for that. The reality is what right. we should really be focusing on is the broader growth and the broader liquidity picture. Because let, let's face Max. it, since the beginning of 2019, we've had more and more liquidity. That's going to change next year. Max, thank you so much. I think everything was set off in terms of bifurcation because of a Bank of America rate strategist call, which said treasuries could go at 1% or at 2%. Max Kettner, multi-asset strategist there at HSBC. We'll have plenty more on the markets and on treasuries. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Francine Lacqua in London and Matt Miller in Berlin. Now let's get the first word news and the U.S. is trying to keep the Taliban from accessing assets belonging to Afghanistan's central bank. The Biden administration has frozen almost nine and a half billion dollars in Afghan accounts. The Taliban remains on the Treasury Department's sanctions list. Meanwhile, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is rejecting calls for a formal inquiry on Afghanistan. He says the Taliban took over the country even faster than they expected. Johnson also said it would have been impossible for British troops to stay in Afghanistan without an American military presence. In Florida, more school districts are squaring off against Governor Ron DeSantis. The schools are considering whether to defy the governor's ban on mask mandates. Thousands of students are being isolated at home because of a new surge in coronavirus cases. And Texas Governor Greg Abbott has been using executive orders and court rulings to fight mask mandates and other anti-pandemic measures. Now he is isolating in the governor's mansion after testing positive for a breakthrough case of the coronavirus. Abbott is fully vaccinated. He is receiving monoclonal antibody treatment. And for seeing the contrast between places like Florida and Texas, where even masks are an issue of concern, and New Zealand, where a single COVID case sends the entire country into lockdown, it's very stark. Yeah, it's stark, and actually I think they have similar vaccination levels. And we also saw, for example, New Zealand and the central bank saying actually they can't raise rates because 10 people have been infected. So it's actually amazing how different regions are going at it different ways. Now, coming up next, Ed Clissold, Ned Davies Research Chief U.S. Strategist. We talk Jackson Hole, we talk inflation. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, Matt Miller in Berlin, and Kay Lines in New York. Matt, I know we're looking at volatility, and actually we're trying to figure out what direction the market will take. And, it, you know, they're looking at inflation, they're looking at uh, COVID and what it means for growth. They've been looking at that for 10 months, so maybe it's just also a quiet August day. Yeah, right. And waiting for something to come out of the Fed, right? Yesterday we heard Jerome Powell speak, but he didn't really say much. Also, um, you know, taxes are key, but they're in recess right now. So we're not going to hear anything out of them for another week. So it, there really is a market right now that's looking for some direction. It could go up or it could go down. I guess that's the point of volatility, but it's not really going much of anywhere right now. No, it's not. And so, Kaylee, how's it all playing out in the markets? 
Well, at risk of sounding like a broken record, Francine, the market is looking for direction. We've seen some fluctuations in Europe. We are off the highs of the session. Really just not a lot of movement at all on the stock 600. It's only up literally less than a tenth of 1% at this point. And here in the U.S., after being in positive territory earlier, S&P 500 futures are in now negative territory, down by about a tenth of 1%. Not a lot of movement in the bond market either. We are essentially unchanged on the U.S. 10-year yield, sitting right around 126. You are getting a little bit more action in commodities, as you have really uh, been for quite some time. Four-day losing streak on oil, the worst since March until today, trying to rebound WTI up about six-tenths of 1%, just shy of $67 a barrel. And as for some stocks to watch in pre-market trading. I have in my eye on vaccine makers. Of course, the U.S. is looking at announcing guidelines on booster shots or a third shot uh, for the likes of Moderna. That stock is up about two tenths of one percent. You also have CureVac and Novavax higher as well. One stock moving to the downside, though, is Cree. Of course, the semiconductor uh, maker. It makes LED products. It reported second quarter uh, or it gave a second quarter revenue forecast that missed expectations. As a result, that stock down the better part of five percent before the bell mat. All right, Kaylee, I want to welcome our listeners on London DAB Digital as I do every day at this hour because it's time for me to show a chart. And of course, they can't see it, but I'll walk you through it. This shows uh, this chart, um, the 10 year yield, as we've seen moving over the past couple of years, uh, down to a low of less than half a percent and then uh, up to a high level for this year of about 1.8 percent. But the point, and it's uh, noted in the headline, is that we're in a bifurcated market. We've been using this word a lot in this hour. Shout out to Manus Cranny and Anne Marie Hordern. What it really means is you can see the yield go up. Or you could see the yield go down, which is, I guess, you know what what happens in these in these markets. Um, the strategist at Bank America, Bruno Breitzina, wrote the market seems to be sitting at the threshold of a major bifurcation of scenarios. And I want to ask Ed Clissold what he thinks those could be. He is chief U.S. strategist Ned Davis Research, joining us now. Ed, um, where do you see the 10-year yield, and what are you driving it? Yeah, so yeah, the 10 year is, is in the middle of a range. We, we went through uh, a tantrum like we've seen several times in the last decade where the 10 year goes up by over 100 basis points over a short period of time. And usually it moves in front of the big news event. That's what happened with the taper before even the first rate hike in the last decade and the tax hikes as well. So, uh, so we've probably gone through a lot of the pricing in of the taper that's likely going to start next year. But from here, you know, fair value is probably about 175. So we'll probably see a, a drift higher. So if you look at the chart that you just showed, Matt, you know, if we're more likely to go to the high end of the range or the low end of the range, next move is probably to the upper end of the range. Ed, the, the concern, I guess, sometimes on the markets is that actually when you have the wide range of, of you know, treasury calls, why are they so, why are they so wide? Well, it's been a conundrum for a long time. If you were to use fair valuation based on where inflation is, where um, other bond yields are, uh, where economic growth is, it should be higher. And yet bond yields keep keep declining. I think there's a supply demand balance here where um, there is there's demand uh, for fixed in income securities. There's lots of concern um, about valuations and equities uh, that, that are that are driving this. And so uh, I think a lot of uh, a lot of of fixed income strategists are probably throwing their hands in the air and wondering uh, why all their models aren't working. Right. I mean, what I would say, and actually I disagree with Matt Miller, we never disagree, but we disagree sometimes on bifurcation. It's not that it goes up or down. It's that certain people, 50 percent, interpret it this way, and the others actually think that inflation is sticky. When will we be, um, you know, kept honest? When do we actually find out who's right? Yeah, the challenge on the inflation front is that we won't know for a long time. Everybody realizes that inflation numbers are going to be running higher for a little while because of base effects and some supply chain issues. The fears out there is if we go back to some 1970s type wage push inflation, uh, but that's just going to take time. And the Fed has signaled they're willing to let this run for a while. So even if the inflation numbers get get hot, um, it doesn't necessarily mean um, that long term inflation expectations expectations have to get out of control. And, and yeah. so that's a, that's a unique position for the market to be in. So Ed, how does this all boil down into an equity thesis? Where do you want to be positioned? 
so here we are, you know, well into the second year of an economic expansion in a bull market. Uh, the pace of gains usually slow. We get more corrections. So it's really a rotation from the early cycle plays into some more defensive plays um, where, um, where maybe before you want to be so cyclical, now you want to have a better balance. Um, we do think there's probably one more cyclical value reopening trade. Hopefully, if the Delta variant starts to calm down, we'll get that. But from there, it's more of a typical bull market. We like mid-cap stocks, more than large or small. That's kind of an underappreciated part of the market. And then rotate into, um, into maybe some bond proxy names uh, like utilities, staples, um, and mm -hmm. the like as a balanced part of your portfolio. And will volatility be more elevated from here? Uh, history says yes, that, that, we're, that you tend to get more volatility um, a, as the bull market uh, steepens or, or gets further along. Uh, keep in mind, too, we've had such huge liquidity over the last year, uh, both from the federal government and from the Federal Reserve. That's going to be coming off the books. Um, most likely next year with a taper, and then um, you know, the, the amount of uh, federal government stimulus. You know, even if we do get this infrastructure spending uh, bill, it's it's not going to be as big of an sh immediate shot in the arm uh, as uh, what we saw with with the, with the COVID plans. And so you take uh, some liquidity away. Think of it like shock absorbers on your car. If the shock absorbers aren't quite as strong. You're, you're going to feel the bumps more often. So you think that the fiscal cliff is maybe the biggest concern for 2022? Um, well, I'd say the, the biggest concern from 2022 is that the, the great earnings numbers that we've seen over the past few quarters are, are not probably going to repeat themselves. I mean, we're, we're on pace for the best beat rate ever for the S&P 500, percentage of companies beating expectations in Q2. That's the fourth record in five quarters. That's going to be hard to repeat just because the comps get tougher. Um, and analysts are, you know, are going to start picking this up. They, they've been so low with their estimates. Uh, they're probably going to have more realistic estimates next yeah. year. And so you're not going to have that going on. Ed, how do you choose mid caps? So do you stay away from those that could actually be negatively hurt by rising inflation? Um, it, that, that's, when we talk about mid caps, what we're really looking at is the cycle between large and small, where small caps get most of their net gains in an entire economic expansion in the first year um, of the bull market. Um, and, and so obviously we're past that point now. Um, and so you want to be focused more on, on mid and large. But in the, in the mid part of the cycle where we think we are, actually mid caps can still outperform uh, large caps because they, they still have higher beta. That is, they, they tend to you know they tend to go up a little bit more than the market when it goes when it goes higher but um, they also are large enough that they don't get um, hit as quickly by say rising interest rates or something like that from uh, uh, that small caps do so it's kind of a sweet part of the cycle they're also less appreciated there's fewer analysts that cover mid caps uh, than than large caps there's fewer assets in mid cap ETFs and, and mutual funds that are in small caps or large caps so it's it's a way to get exposure beyond just sticking with your same mega cap names um, without necessarily getting hung up in, in maybe some problems that small caps can run into. Ed, thank you so much. Ed Clissold there, chief U.S. strategist at Ned Davis Research. Now turning to the most second most valuable cryptocurrency behind Bitcoin, on the latest episode of Bloomberg Studio 1.0, Emily Chang speaks with the creator of Ethereum about the future of digital coins alongside existing currencies. Replacing the dollar completely is unlikely, um, just uh, because like there's things that the dollar provides, like uh, price stability, for example, that Bitcoin is uh, not going to provide. Like I think even in a theoretical world where um, the U.S. dollar collapses, like even then, I think uh, Bitcoin is not going to be able to provide the level of like stability that users and businesses expect to be able to set prices in. Um, and in that kind of world, like we, we would need something else. Like we, like it could be decentralized stable coins. It could be something else, but we'll see. Um, so, but at the same time, I think cryptocurrency can still have a very powerful and important role alongside uh, existing uh, currencies. Well, that was a co-founder of Ethereum, and you can catch the full conversation tonight on Bloomberg Studio 1.0 at 9.30 p.m. in New York. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later on today, Mike Novogratz, Galaxy Digital CEO and founder. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua in London, Matt Miller in Berlin, Kaylee Lines in New York. Now, one bank after the next has increased pay for junior bankers in recent weeks, including Goldman Sachs. The development shows just how much the tables have turned and how much banks, just like many other companies right now, are desperate for talent. It's today's big take and the cover story for the latest issue of Bloomberg Business Week. Let's get more on this with our Bloomberg opinion columnist, Marcus Ashworth. Marcus, thank you so much for joining us. So nice to see you in the studio. Look, I mean, it's incredible because there's always been war for talent, right? But it used to be the senior people. Is, does the pandemic actually shift the focus onto juniors and retaining them with more money? Not really, and I don't quite understand why all these banks are, are, are raising the ante because they're getting the same people. They're just paying more for them. Uh, and all the complaints have been about working conditions, not the actual pay for the work. So it just seems chasing uh, everyone's tail. Go on the last to do it, but then they can afford to be the last. And normally what they do anyway is they wait to everyone else, other banks, to train up people for the first two or three years, all the expensive bit, and then go poach them anyway, which I'm sure they will do. So I think it's across the whole chain that the uh, wages are rising. And the reason of that is because it's been boom times. So the banks have never made so much money. I mean, if you're a kid um, graduating from college now and you can work at any of these banks, do you still want to go to Goldman Sachs anyway, regardless of the fact that they're giving you $10,000 more? I mean, are they just doing that for bragging rights rather than to attract talent? Exactly. Uh, spot on. You still want to join Goldman. I wish I could say differently, but um, it is simply that. They are probably still the, the elite place to go. There are, there are a handful of others who are equally good. But the question it really is not so much is it Goldman versus Morgan Stanley versus JP Morgan are all equally excellent. It's whether it's private equity or it's tech or it's doing something yeah. studying your own mm. startup. And that's the real competition. Well, and Marcus, there's a lot that goes into compensation. It's not just salary for banks, bonuses, but then there's also things like benefits and work-life balance. I mean, how does that factor into this equation here? Well, I should always remember my first job, the thing we got most excited about is the thing called luncheon vouchers, which was 20 pounds per month, which you could only use in certain mm. stores. But that was the thing we got all excited about. It is, of course, about the bigger, wider package. And really what we're talking about here is, is, the, is the bottom of the inverted triangle. The starting wage is not what these people go join Goldman Sachs or any of the banks for. It's the bonuses which accrue as the years go by. Right. What does happen in years go by? So then you get poached by others. What I'm surprised about is how much, you know, how much retention is there for these junior bankers? So how many of them, when the crop is up, get paid 100000 then get on to managing partners? Well, it, that's the whole point. They, whit they whitter them, and them down and they poach the best people from elsewhere. So the competition in that intake pool is intense because you know probably 50 percent are not going to make it. And it's not just because they aren't going to end up with 100 percent the same numbers. It's they're going to take in best people from other banks. And that's what keeps them on their toes. But yeah, it's, it's uh, a nice position to be in. An extra 10 or 15,000 always helps. <laughs> I wonder how much longer we're going to see them clustered around New York and London. Is that a forever thing? Because I'd rather, much rather work in, like, Jackson, Wyoming or San Diego, California. I think you have to read the body language of J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley and Goldman in particular. They're very clear. They want people back in the office, and that principally means Wall Street. And the same, I think, in the city of London. Look, Europe is, uh, needs to create its own uh, financial markets, and it's clearly doing so. But I think the hiring will come from indigenous you know, areas. It won't just be people who've been transferred from London. And I think uh, as the years go by, I think people will slip back to London because still it's the best, most attractive place to work for, for the majority of people. Now, not necessarily for everyone, but it is for the majority. Still. Oh, come on, let's say it's the most fun city in the world. It is. Well, you know, Frankfurt on a wet Wednesday afternoon has its charms. Oh, oh, yes. Understated political or British politeness. Uh, Bloomberg opinion columnist there, Marcus Ashworth. Now, you and if you read all about, you can read rather all about Wall Street pay in the latest issue of Bloomberg Business Week. Coming up, fighting the Delta variant, more on Moderna's vaccination efforts. Next, from co founder Nubar Afayan. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacquin in London. Matt Merler in Berlin. Katie Lines in New York. Now, with governments around the world debating whether to authorize COVID-19 vaccine booster doses, Moderna co-founder and chairman Nubar Afayan envisions a time when the shot could actually become routine. He discusses Moderna's efforts to fight the Delta variant and beyond on the latest episode of the David Rubenstein Show, Peer to Peer Conversations. We are, as technology developers, preparing for any eventuality including looking at what our baseline vaccine after two doses does, which so far six months data we have available is very, very robust. We haven't seen any real deterioration of our protection. That's first. Against the Delta virus, we have very strong protection, and we expect that will continue for a period of time. The problem is we don't know for how long, because you find out when your guard is down after your guard is down. So in order to prepare for that eventuality, we have begun to make variant vaccines, vaccines that have different sequences that if needed, we could accelerate so that we can actually use that. So I think we're gonna work very closely with regulators, FDA, CDC here and, and the Europeans, to figure out from an arsenal of, the beauty about the mRNA technology is that we can actually do this type of rapid response versus conventional biotechnology that takes years and years to do the same thing. Well, to get to the heart of the problem, my own personal situation, so I got two uh, Moderna shots. Do I need a booster shot? I think that the best advice so far is that people uh, after a certain age, and I cannot tell you right now what that age cutoff will be because that will be set by the government, are most likely going to need a booster to be well protected against the variant. And over time, again, public health officials are going to have to decide if everybody should get a booster shot. My guess is that given enough time, we may well end up in a situation where we have yearly, let's say, at a minimum, yearly vaccinations, just like the flu. So Tony Fauci has said that we should use this example of what happened with the coronavirus to prepare for other potential viruses down the road and that hopes companies like yours will do that. Are you working on that kind of thing in now already? Or? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. A very big part of Moderna's future will be in being the leading vaccine developer, but also with mRNA technology, but also additional new technologies that we're considering to augment our capability. But I should also say that within the broader flagship pioneering context, which is where I operate, we have multiple projects as well looking to expand the security net for future pandemics. Well, that was the Moderna co-founder and chairman, Nubar Afayana. You can catch the full interview tonight on the David Rubenstein Show, peer-to-peer -peer conversations, 9 p.m. in New York, 7 p.m in London. I don't think actually that matches, but there are a couple of times it will be played out. Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg <laughs> Surveillance, now joins us. Uh, Tom, I actually thought you were going to show me a VIX chart, but you have initial jobless claims well, chart. that's a good point. VIX out to 18 from, say, a 15, 16 level, and the drawdown's been huge. It's less than 1% on Standard & Poor's 500. Dow's down a little bit more. The market's a little bit upset. I'm watching Swiss Frank. But what I want to do, uh, uh, Francine, is get to tomorrow, which is jobless claims, which should be another reaffirmation of what Chairman Powell cares about, which is wage inflation. It's not there. That gives him comfort. So <clears throat> wage inflation isn't there yet, and he's trying to bring it on. Is that the point? It's not, well, that's a good question. The answer is, man, I'm not sure he wants to bring it on, per se, but they'd like to see a better labor share. It hasn't happened yet. And, you know, this just it's just a key, key inflation variable that hasn't happened. Claims have to improve and continue their improvement. And Fed minutes, Tom, what would you be looking out for? Uh, everybody knows, Kaylee, I'm not big on Fed minutes. Several, some. Several of the 5 a.m. <laughs> Bloomberg surveillance team had coffee. <laughs> Some of them Tom. dreamt about Ducati motorcycles. <laughs> a few started worrying about, you know, like, when should we leave the wedding? I mean, you know, different things here. Several, select few. That's what the minutes are. I don't watch them. Okay, if you don't watch that, I mean, if we go to, but what are the markets watching, Tom? Never mind what you're watching. <clears throat> That's a good question. What are the markets watching? I think they're watching two things. They're watching the foundation of earnings, which is GDP. Morgan Stanley marked down yesterday from a 6 9 ish down to about, <coughs> excuse me, 6.5. And I think you're going to see some GDP markdowns off of sort of the soggy retail that we saw. That's what they're watching. All right. Some would agree with Tom Keene. Several. A few would disagree with <coughs> Kaylee. <laughs> Tom Keene, co-anchor 
of Bloomberg, so mm -hmm. very, very few. Uh, let's also take a look at what else we're watching today. Kaylee, you're looking at retail sales. Well, I'm looking at retail earnings. We get a few or several of them today and really throughout the rest of this week, Francine. Of course, we had Walmart and Home Depot yesterday. We get their two biggest competitors this morning, Lowe's and Target. So will they echo kind of the same trends? Of course, for Lowe's, do they show the same pullback in that growth in home improvement that was seen throughout the pandemic? That's what we saw yesterday with Home Depot and that big comp sales miss. And then with Target, like Walmart, I'm going to be paying attention to e-commerce sales. But of course, for any retailer, Matt, we also have to watch the margins. I got to say, um, I'm right there with you, Kaylee. When it comes to markets, I'm watching retail earnings as well. I'm going to be following um, these stories as they come across the ticker. But when it comes to everyday life, I can't lie, I'm going to still watch the Afghanistan stories. When I'm in line at the dentist or sitting on the couch with Steve um, and looking at my phone, Afghanistan is first and foremost in terms of what I'm searching and what I'm reading. Me too. And actually, it's, um, you know, th there's been some great opinion pieces also from our Bobby Gosh uh, over here in London about uh, the failure of actually the training of the Afghan army. The other thing I'm watching out, and this broke out about 15 minutes ago, Kaylee brought to our attention, is uh, Picte seeing that uh, Boris Kalardi is leaving uh, the company effective September 1st. Remember, Kalardi was also reprimanded earlier this year by the financial regular regulator in Switzerland over a money laundering probe. He was chief executive. Julius Baer until three years ago when he joined Pecte. So it's interesting to see exactly how that will develop. More Bloomberg surveillance is coming up ahead. We'll also hear from Nikolai Tangen, the Norges Bank Investment Management Chief Executive Officer. This is Bloomberg.